all the friends we have come today with a very new topic and a very interesting topic for a discussion friends we would be talking on theory and debate on state in comparative politics friends in today's lecture we would be discussing basically theories and in our forthcoming lecture we would be discussing on debate uh, regarding the state in comparative politics friends in today's session we would be covering liberalism and Uh, Marxism and for this discussion on the two theories we have with us in our studios Dr Satish Kumar Jha Dr Satish Kumar Jha is an associate professor in Department of Political Science Aryabhat College University of Delhi Dr Jha has immense experience and his experience always uh, gives us deep insight into the various issues and topics and we believe that from today's session also you are going to learn a lot friends if you want to ask questions from Dr Satish Kumar Jha on today's topic then do call us through our free number our number is 18001010430 i repeat our number is 18001010430 so let's welcome our guest dr satish kumar jha and let's try to understand liberalism and marxism hello sir welcome to the lecture thank you avitika ji and uh, good afternoon uh, today's lecture we are going to devote on a uh, topic that is uh, theory and debate on state in comparative politics uh in fact uh, the importance of uh, the state as an institution uh, in political science in particular in social science in general has been recognized from the very beginning and therefore uh, in fact what we find that the entire political theory and political thought are replete with instances where thinkers engage with this issue and try to reflect on this uh, theme in their own way uh but you know of late what happened that when political science started a distancing itself from other social sciences and the boundaries were created and political science as a discipline emerged with various branches including comparative politics then we find that the state uh, the theme of the, on uh, of a state or i mean the entire discussion on a state got incorporated within the broad rubric called comparative politics and uh, this entire thing has happened over last uh, one and a, you know hun- more than 100 years uh, particularly after political science uh became a very you know prominent uh, area of uh, study in various uh, universities in the world uh now uh, i mean therefore what we find that what we discuss in name of state in comparative politics a uh, theories and debates uh, uh you know mostly are drawn from the resources which are avail- available in theory and thought but at the same time there is no denying the fact that comparative politics itself as a separate branch or a very important branch of political science has engaged with this issue and a lot of debates have happened over the years uh, now if we look at the debates uh, then we find uh, that this entire debate on uh, you know the state in political uh, science or in comparative politics uh, is uh, basically divided along ideological lines and the two ideologies which have been basically contesting each other uh have been you know uh, vying f- with each other for supremacy within the discipline uh, one is liberalism another is marxism but so far as the question of state is concerned both in liberalism and marxism we find that a very you know uh, illuminating uh, exciting and at the same time you know very uh, you know uh, hot debate uh, has materialized on this question that is the state uh, and uh, its various uh in you know, apparatuses uh, and therefore we find uh, that uh, hardly we find there is any literature in, on comparative politics which doesn't uh, recognize the importance of state today of course uh, in fact we should also remember that there was a period particularly post second world war period uh, when uh, political science was in grip of a new intellectual uh, you know movement uh, that was called behavioralism and subsequently a uh, structural functionalism and system uh, you know theories uh, which emerged as a result of that behavioral revolution in political science about which we, we have had discussions in our earlier lectures uh, we find that there was an attempt to uh, be, you know down uh, you know downgrade the importance of state in the discipline an attempt was also made to replace it with a new category a new concept that was called political system instead of a state we find that uh, many scholars many political scientists started preferring the term uh, you know political system instead of state uh, argument was very simple uh, that a state is an abstract uh, concept which doesn't help us in understanding various nuances of politics uh, 
and therefore political system would replace it incorporating some of the uh, themes, some of the issues which were earlier discussed under uh, the discussion on the state. Uh, but you know even in you know when uh, you know political science was in the grip of this uh, movement uh, even then we find that a lot of scholars uh, even under you know recognize the importance of a state. Uh, so I mean the importance of a state uh, within comparative politics or political science did not disappear completely ever. Uh, but of course uh, later on we find uh, that the earlier when the earlier uh, you know uh, you know this entire system theory, structural functionalism and other things started losing their sign uh, and many scholars started realizing uh, you know uh, the, the, the limitations of those approaches. Then we find that uh, you know an attempt was made to bring back this entire uh, discussion on the state on the center stage of the discipline. And the title of the book which Thera Scott Paul wrote bringing a state back in is suggestive of that. Uh, you know, moment suggestive of that mood. So all these issues are part of the discussion on uh, our discussion on uh, the theory and debate on the state in comparative politics, which will be divided in two parts. And today is the part one, where we will be essentially discussing the theories, and uh, tomorrow perhaps more on the debate, uh, particularly within both tradition, the liberal and the Marxist tradition, so far as uh, the state in comparative politics is concerned. But before we uh, move on to our discussion about the theories uh, and uh, you know the debates on the state. Uh, when we talk of theories then essentially what we mean that how scholars have uh, interpreted uh, you know the modern state uh, particularly in modern context uh, how they uh, look at the functioning of the state. And here in fact the two issues uh, you know become important. One is the structural institutional issue another is the functional issue. But before that, before we take to this discussion, we start our discussion on this structural, institutional and function part, the evolution becomes important that how the modern state has evolved. And uh, you know because one thing is uh, to be remembered uh, that from the very beginning since our you know human history, written human history, uh, we know that human beings have lived with some sense of political authority. Uh, you know even if it was uh, you know in a very different form but nonetheless uh, you know some uh, you know concept of authority always prevail uh, among uh, human beings particularly after they became a settled community. Uh, this is how the evolution of a state is uh, you know traced by historians. Uh, this is how perhaps uh, the Marxist tradition uh, which historicizes this entire issue uh, using a materialist interpretation of history. Uh, you know using the dialectical method they also I mean the Marx himself uh, provided very insightful uh, you know ideas that how a uh, state has come into existence. That will be the part of our discussion when we will we'll, you know we will refer to Marxism. Uh, but even in the liberal tradition we know uh, that uh, there has always been a very uh, you know uh, informed debate on this question of evolution of a state in India, uh, evolution of a state. And therefore, uh, in political theory in particular, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, that comparative politics draws heavily on the resources from political theory and political thought. What we find uh, that political theory engaged with this question uh, at the very outset, uh, in the very beginning, uh, that what how this state came into existence, uh, or the question of political obligation that what do why do we obey the state all these issues were you know quite significant by pol for political thinkers and political theorists and therefore in fact political theory starts with the discussion of the theories of the origin of the state be it social contract evolutionary force uh, so on and so forth so therefore this evolution part is important now when we look at this evolution part what we find uh, that the first initial instances uh, you know we find about this evolution discussion about the state is in the Greek period but in Greek political thought which was very profound. Uh, but not only Greek but you know in the same period we also find that in India we have had a similar profound discussion on the state. Particularly you know Cotillia's Arthasast is a, a great test you know great uh, document a uh, great piece of writing to understand uh, that what is a state, how it functions, what are its institutions, what are its apparatuses and so on and so forth. So though the title is Arthasastra which translates into English as economics, but many scholars observe that it is more uh, you know more of a book 
on public administration and the state authority than perhaps on economics. So, this is something to be remembered that in ancient period this entire discussion uh, you know was uh, there both in the west as well as in the east and instances I mean the, the one can give one can cite the uh, reference of Plato and Aristotle in Greek period and uh, you know the Cotill uh, and uh, you know the Cotillia in uh, India. So, this is how uh, we find that the ancient period even in Mahabharata that epic uh, in particularly in Shant Parv, Shanti Parv and a lot of scholars who have studied ancient Indian political thought have observed uh, that there are marvelous uh, you know that is a great piece uh, to understand ethics, morality, political power, authority and the functioning of uh, you know the power in you know, authority and the state. So, therefore, this ancient period is there. Now, of course, the medieval period we find uh, that we have had a different situation, particularly in West, the rise of feudalism, uh, you know, rise of church state, uh, when there was an alliance between the church and the state, and a very different type of, uh, you know, societal model prevailed at that time under feudalism. So, therefore, medieval period, of course, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, insightful ideas uh, about many things, including the state. But the nature of a state was different. If the ancient period, the state and society were considered a part of an organic whole, uh, this is how perhaps the Plato and Aristotle looked at it, particularly Plato. Uh, Aristotle, of course, was slightly uh, more, uh, you know, profound in terms of understanding of institutions uh, and its functioning. And that is why, in fact, it is not just a chance that he is at times referred as father of political science, because political science as a branch of social science which uh, considers the discussion and the study of power, authority and state as central to its enterprise, perhaps draws heavily on Aristotle who has studied 158 constitutions uh, to make observation that which can be considered the ideal constitution, uh, what can be considered the best polity. So, therefore, the Greek period of course is important and its understanding on a state is equally important which looked at it in organic frame that is state and society did not make much distinction between a state and society. Uh, in fact, uh, rather considered uh, you know human beings uh, to be part of this large organic whole. Uh, in fact, uh, this question that why do you obey the state was answered totally differently by them. Uh, that it is something like if hands start asking that why should they obey the body. So, therefore, I mean this organic model of a state uh, was prevalent in Greek period particularly uh, as we see through the writings of Plato, Aristotle and many other Greek thinkers. And medieval period I as I was mentioning was different. Still uh, the state the kind of alliance which happened between the church and the state uh, you know offered a different uh, situation. Uh, where in fact it was a very fragmented authority system between the church and the state and at the local level of course the feudal lords. Uh, but you know what happens that modern period uh, becomes very significant from the point of view of this theory and debate on a state in comparative politics. And uh, you know this is how uh, comparative politics perhaps uh, looks at or uh, discusses this theme uh, particularly in modern uh, context, modern historical context. And it is here uh, that you know this uh, Treaty of Westphalia becomes important in 1648 uh, when the four essential attributes of a state were for the first time defined uh, that is uh, territory, population, government and sovereignty. And this is how uh, perhaps uh, that created a model for uh, the state uh, in Europe in particular, but later on it became uh, universalized uh, and it is at times referred as Westphalian model of state uh, you know institutions or state uh, evolution. So, this Westphalian model, uh, Treaty of Westphalia of course had a context, it emerged after 30 years war, the religious war and therefore, what happened that this treaty brought peace and this entire Europe was basically uh, you know divided into very territorial units and uh, this is how perhaps the rise of nation state is also uh, traced through this Treaty of Test, uh, Treaty of Westphalia of 1648. So, therefore, this Westphalian model uh, becomes very significant or the Treaty of Westphalia becomes very important when it for the first time defined the four attributes of the state that is territory, population, government and uh, sovereignty. Now, what happened that the first uh, instance of this uh, Westphalian uh, 
uh, model of a state we find uh, coming through a revolution and that is the French Revolution of 1789. And the French Revolution was of course uh, the product of this type of theoretical churning. Of course, uh, this is in fact here we do not have the time to go into the context of the French Revolution. But what I want to refer here that the French Revolution produced the first model that is Westphalian model of state system in the world with centralized authority uh, with the kind of understanding of sovereignty which evolved out of this uh, you know of treaty, uh, the kind of understanding of territory which basically crystallized with this treaty, the kind of unitary model, a very unified authority system, the sovereignty, monistic theory of sovereignty as it is called in political theory. So therefore, French revolution symbolized that Westphalian model and therefore what happened that in the entire Europe that model gradually spread that unified authority, a monolithic or monistic concept of sovereignty, unified territory with a standing army and various apparatuses, apparatus of the state, institutions and so on and so forth. So that was the first important uh, you know, model in modern times that is the Westphalian model. And therefore what we find that the modern period of course symbolized and signaled many new developments, but one important development was about this understanding of a state in modern times. I will turn to this issue later. First of all, let us have a historical uh, you know, idea that how this happened. Uh, because accordingly we find that lot of theoretical, philosophical, uh, ideological reflections were also made on this entire question. Uh, be it the social contract theorist like Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau or subsequently we find that the great German philosopher Hegel uh, who influ influenced Karl Marx who basically created an alternative perspective on this entire issue of history, state formation and uh, the functions of the state. And subsequently uh, many other thinkers who are often referred as liberal thinkers John Stuart Mill, Bantham and so on and so forth. So therefore what we find that this evolution of a state in modern times or one can say the institutionalization of a state uh, in a different context, different setting because modern period when we talk of modern period that modern period implies many things. It implies rise of capitalism, it implies scientific revolution, it implies reformation and renaissance in Europe it implied enlightenment and therefore we find that modernity as a whole symbolized many new churnings, many new developments and this entire uh, Westphalian, you know the rise of Westphalian model of a state was also part of that process. So therefore what we find that the French uh, revolution created a, a different type of model of a state, uh, you know institution in modern time uh, and gradually it spread in different parts of the world. But in fact what we find um, that uh, along with this uh, French revolution there was another revolution uh, which was historically as significant as French revolution and that basically also created an alternative frame uh, so far as the state and its institutions are concerned and that was American war of independence of 1776 and 77 and ultimately Philadelphia convention of 1787. So what we find that this deviated from this Westphalian model of a state uh, formation or a state institutions. And this model which is known as the federal model, not the Westphalian model because if Westphalian model stood for unified uh, authority system, if Westphalian model uh, talked about monistic concept of sovereignty, unified ter 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 you know, territory, so on and so forth, this American uh, you know, revolution created a different alternative uh, frame to understand this entire thing. And this is referred at, at times as a federal model of a state evolution. And uh, what was basically significant about this federal model was that it was based on the, you know, the concept of shared sovereignty. And this shared sovereignty which is basically at the heart of this entire federal arrangement uh, you know, provided an alternative frame to this Westphalian model which was basically based on monolithic concept of authority and power. So therefore this federal model of United States of America when 13 colonies uh, revolted against their masters, the European masters and uh, that became the war of independence and subsequently when uh, you know the first important democratic 
written constitution came into existence with many new innovations including uh, you know uh, fundamental rights uh, you know uh, the, the way they talked about division separation of power uh, inspired by Locke and Montesquieu the way they you know looked at this entire question of democratization checkmating power power limitation of, on power a limited government checkmating power with power all the innovations were made within this broad uh, frame of uh, you know the federal state system which emerged for the first time in united states of america particularly after 1787 philadelphia convention the same federal model traveled from uh, north america to europe and therefore what we find at 1840s the swiss switzerland became the first federal uh, model of a state in europe because the more dominant uh, model which was in existence in Europe at that time was the Westphalian model about which I was referring. But the Switzerland became the first uh, federal model in Europe and subsequently in fact this model uh, did not remain confined to North America or Europe but spread in different parts of the world and today perhaps federal model of the state system is perhaps most popular, most uh, attractive and therefore wherever a new constitution is drafted. It is modeled on this federal pattern, of course, uh, incorporating uh, new dimensions, new features. And therefore, what we find that when this model from North America traveled to Europe and from Europe it traveled to different parts of the world, particularly uh, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada and, United, and India uh, and uh, basically created a third model uh, which at times is referred as Commonwealth. Uh, model of uh, you know federal state uh, parliamentary commonwealth model in the sense that most of them were colonies of Britain but nonetheless uh, they adopted a system uh, which basically was uh, created United States of America. So I mean this has become how this commonwealth parliamentary model uh, you know parliamentary federal model as at times it is referred incorporating both dimensions the parliamentary feature as well as the federal, federal feature. And then at the same time what we find that these two models the Westphalian and the federal model became dominant ones within the liberal tradition. But at the same time other models also uh, came into existence in modern time and one was the socialist model. And that model emerged essentially in Soviet Union after the Bolshevik revolution of 1917 uh, and subsequently in many Eastern European countries and uh, in China after 1949 and many Latin American countries, Cuba and so on and so forth. So that was uh, the third model one can say uh, that was socialist model and uh, particularly drawing on the ideas of Marx and uh, Engels and uh, of course uh, the Russian uh, revolution drew as much on the ideas of Lenin uh, who was the architect of the Bolshevik revolution. So therefore this Marx, Engels, Lenin tradition uh, on the state, uh, its you know their reflection on the state, its functioning, its, uh, its role, its evolution uh, inspired this third model that was the socialist model. But in fact along with this we find that many more models came into existence, uh, you know modified version of Marxism and modified version of liberalism. Uh, in fact, and therefore this debate on the state became very uh, interesting uh, and also very profound in comparative politics. And so much so that one, uh, you know, a very competent authority on comparative politics, Ronald Chilcott, uh, in fact, uh, while, while basically surveying this entire debate and literature on the state in comparative politics, uh, in fact, uh, gives a very interesting graph saying that there are uh, four mainstream theories and there are four alternative to those mainstream theories. The first is a pluralist capitalist model and uh, its alternative is pluralist socialist. Similarly, there is an institutional model and its alternative is instrumentalist. The third is the corporatist model and its alternative is structuralist and the fourth is the bureaucratic authoritarian model uh, of a state and its alternative is feminist. So therefore, these four mainstream and its alternatives as basically sketched by Chilcott tells something that how this churning on the state has been going on in comparative politics and that has created the debate uh, quite interesting. But before we turn to this debate, essence, you know, first of all we look at the question of the idea or on the state or the you know, theories of a state within liberalism and Marxism and then we will turn to this question of debate.
with this note thank you so thank you so very much for giving us a productive session friends we would be meeting after a very short break and we would be continuing our lecture further Hello friends welcome back in this session where we are discussing on liberalism and marxism is yet to be discussed first we would be uh, talking more on liberalism and yes of course in this session we would be covering marxism too and for this discussion we have with us in our studios dr satish kumar jha dr satish kumar uh, jha is uh, continuously with us so if you want to ask questions from him then do call us through our toll free number our number is 18001010430 now i would like to request best dr satish kumar jha to continue further and explain us in detail about liberalism as well as marxism too thank you meetika ji i uh, good afternoon and uh, in fact uh, the discussion uh, we are having earlier on the theory and debate on state in comparative politics we have seen that how this entire uh, concept of a state in modern period has become so central to comparative politics and political science uh in fact i was also mentioning earlier that uh, initially you know the resources were drawn from political theory and political thought but later on the comparative comparativists uh in political science themselves uh you know started uh, engaging with this question and therefore what we find that of late uh, we have now a plethora of literature on this theme that is the state in comparative politics particularly uh from both point of view the structural as well as the functional part that what is the state what are its structural attributes uh how it you know functions and so on and so forth so therefore uh, this is the contribution one can say of this discipline so far as this understanding of state is concerned but this has not happened just accidentally uh there has been a very sustained uh, rigorous research on this issue and necessitated by many historical developments and in 20th century some of the developments which necessitated this new uh, reflection on the state uh, included the great depression of 1920s and 30s economic depression rise of communism uh, particularly after the bolshevik revolution in soviet union and its uh, spread in various parts of the world 
and then in interwar period the rise of fascism and nazism in you know italy and germany so therefore these developments uh, necessitated uh, you know a, a new understanding uh, necessitated a more rigorous uh, discussion of this concept of a state and therefore we find that a lot of uh, scholar a scholarly interest was uh, diverted and so on on this theme and uh, in fact uh, immediately after second world war the entire phenomenon which is also referred as the rise of welfare state in uh, you know in comparative politics uh, was also perhaps a factor which propelled many scholars to discuss this issue afresh so therefore these were the historical context as i was mentioning earlier that westphalia the treaty of westphalia and subsequently the french revolution was a context similarly the rise of federal polity united states of america and uh, traveling to europe in switzerland and then later on in many commonwealth countries were also a kind of a historic moment similarly uh, in uh, 20th century these moments which i have just now enumerated a uh, great economic depression rise of communism uh, rise of fascism and nazism rise of welfare state uh, along with uh, many uh, you know rise of many authoritarian states one party uh, you know uh, based state system in many african countries and latin american countries and even on in some asian countries also perhaps uh, necessitated a fresh discussion on the concept of a state and accordingly we find that the comparative politics got enriched so far as the debate and discussion on the state is concerned now one thing is uh, to be remembered that most of the discussions on this concept of a state uh, in this period uh, was of course inspired by uh, liberalism and marxism uh, and therefore what we find that these two theories uh, in fact liberalism and marxism the way they look at the state have been the major source of inspiration for this entire discussion on uh, the theory and uh, you know theory and debate in com- on a state in comparative politics now liberal theory from the very beginning has looked at uh, you know the state as an institution uh, or an a, a, or a, you know a set of institutions to reconcile conflicting interests in society because reconciliation of interest conflicting interest is the hallmark of liberalism because liberalism uh, doesn't believe that with politics uh, with political mechanism uh, with negotiation and dialogue with various institutions uh, uh, you know uh, any conflict cannot be reconciled so therefore uh, the reconciliation of conflict conflicting interests is the hallmark of liberal understanding of politics and accordingly a state is also considered as one institution which is basically endowed with this authority to uh, reconcile conflicting interests now of course therefore what we find that at times a state is referred as above a narrow parochial sectarian interest it is basically above societal interests it is basically an institution which is for all uh, which looks after the interest of everyone irrespective of uh, his or her class position on the other hand the marxist theory uh, looks at the state in altogether different frame uh, for marxism a uh, state is the product of class struggle in society and it is here that marx basically provided a historical materialist understanding of the state that how a state came into existence uh, from the very beginning a uh, state was not there uh, when human beings started the historic journey uh, it was uh, you know living without any state authority or a state institution only after they became a settled community from hunter gatherer they became agriculturists when some production process started when surplus was generated when the first instance of class formation took place in history then they basically the, then the marxism argues that such institutions came into existence and subsequently it continued to bear the birth mark of its parents because the purpose for which it emerged it retained that essential character throughout the history the only period when it argues that its character will change would only when the revolution will bring about fundamental and structural changes in production process will replace capitalist mode of production with socialist mode of production when uh, there will be no exploitation there will be no class disparities when there will be no inequality only then the state will basically change its character otherwise a state will always function in the interest of the dominant classes the propertied classes 
in the interest of the privileged class. This is perhaps the dominant understanding within Marxism so far as state is concerned. The best example is uh, that pamphlet, the Communist Manifesto, which Marx and Engels wrote in 1848. Uh, that manifesto clearly says that a state is the managing committee of the bourgeoisie because uh, the, you know, the bourgeois class, the capitalist class needs such institutions to manage its affairs. And that gives a conception and that gives a wrong conception that it is functioning in the interest of all. But the fact of the matter is that it functions only in the interest of those dominant classes which have their control on the means of production. So therefore, there is a fundamental difference between the liberal and the Marxist understanding of the state. But what has happened within comparative politics that within both tradition, liberal and the Marxist tradition, of late we have seen a very heated uh, debate and discussion on this theme that how a state functions. Uh, at times, uh, it becomes difficult uh, to associate a state with one particular class interest in society. Uh, you know, this entire instrumentalist notion of a state within Marxism, which I was referring to, which is at times referred as a classical orthodox model or un uh, orthodox understanding of a state, uh, is basically found inadequate to understand and explain the contemporary situation. And therefore, many scholars with Marxist ideological persuasion have basically gone beyond this instrumentalist notion of a state and have basically enriched this entire discussion by bringing new insights. And here, two names uh, can be mentioned about whom we will have more discussion in our next lecture. One is Althusser, Louis Althusser and, um, you know, and Pollinger's. Uh, who basically uh, operationalized altogether new different understanding of Marxism, which at times he referred as a structural Marxism, and Miliband and many others uh, who are at times referred as instrumentalists, uh, so, so far as inst instrumentalist understanding of state. But not only uh, Althusser, Polenza, and Miliband, but even the Italian Marxist philosopher Gramsci, through his concept of hegemony, has also contributed significantly on this, you know, in the development uh, of new understanding about the state, uh, that how a state uh, functions. And therefore, this concept of hegemony, along with many later Marxist scholars like Goran Thadborn, uh, you know, Laclau, Chantal, Moffe, and many others, many of them of late have been referred as, uh, you know, post-Marxist, neo-Marxist, uh, you know, or one can say, uh, you know, uh, with various uh, names they are referred, but nonetheless they operated within Marxist tradition and have enriched this entire question of, uh, you know, the state uh, in comparative politics and political theory. Similarly, within liberal tradition, we also find similarly interesting uh, debate and discussion taking place. And therefore, as I was referring earlier uh, to Chilcott's, you know, this uh, entire uh, graph, a uh, graphic representation of the development on the state that is basically a uh, pluralist capitalist uh, that how scholars look at a state as in terms of pluralist capitalist frame then uh, you know institutional then corporatist then uh, bureaucratic authoritarian particularly in context of brazil and the latin american situation how many liberal scholars have started talking about this bureaucratic authoritarian model of a state and so on and so forth similarly in context of third world our uh, developed state uh, for example, Hamza Alavi and many others, uh, many other scholars started talking that uh, how third world countries like India have had an overdeveloped uh, state because, uh, you know, the uh, state became more developed, the state institutions became more developed uh, than the society uh, and than the class structure. And therefore, even Karl Marx, when he talked of Asiatic mode of production, uh, he made a, uh, you know, exception for these societies. Or, uh, for example, there are many instances uh, when this Asian uh, social situation, social formations were seen through a different prism uh, by these uh, scholars, which of course of late has been uh, called a Eurocentric, uh, you know, bias uh, against these Asian countries. But nonetheless, uh, there are many issues related to this state, state formation, the functioning of a state even in third world countries, and I just mentioned Hamza Alavi's concept of our developed state. So therefore, within liberal tradition as well, we find that very interesting uh, debate has uh, materialized over the years, so far as the state in comparative politics is concerned. But on the top of it, uh, much more than all these things, what basically signaled the most important uh, 
uh, development in comparative politics from the liberal point of view was the rise of this concept of political system or the political system approach in comparative politics, particularly aftermath of this behavioral revolution. Not only political system approach, but even structural functionalism. These two things, uh, which in 50s and 60s basically created intellectual tremor in the entire world, uh, perhaps influenced this entire discussion of a state much more than anything else. And I was mentioning earlier that these two theories, the structural functionalism and the system approach, they try to replace this entire concept called a state with a new category called political system. And the argument was that a state is an abstract concept, concept is an abstract category and it does not make much sense, particularly in context of newly independent nations of Asia, Africa and Latin America. And therefore, there is a need for a new conceptualization, a new you know, categorization. And therefore, they thought that the liberal, this political system would be more appropriate, uh, you know, category uh, to understand uh, this entire phenomenon, uh, you know, in, in these newly independent nations. Uh, in fact, Almond, who was one of the high priest of this entire, uh, you know, uh, intellectual movement. Uh, in fact, Almond, uh, when he wrote his book, uh, that is Politics of Developing Areas in 1960, in introduction itself, he argued that a state was imbued with many concepts many meanings and therefore could not be operationalized in comparative investigation with which the political scientists were basically engaging. And therefore, uh, because of the proliferation of many newly independent nations, comparative politics scholars required new concepts, new categories uh, to do comparative investigation. And therefore, he suggested along with his colleagues that political system will be more appropriate category to discuss uh, political authority and power in the society. Now, Elmond of course also mentioned that a state con conceived in Weberian sense uh, with due attention to legally empowered and legitimately uh, coercive institutions would be simultaneously assimilated uh, in the concept of political system with new institutions. Uh, extra legal, para legal, uh, political parties, interest groups, uh, you know, communication, media, family, schools, church, etc. And therefore, basically, uh, try to give this impression that the earlier uh, Weberian theory uh, of power authority would be harmonized with new understanding, where extra legal, para legal, and many other informal institutions like political parties, interest groups, and so on and so forth will be the subject matter of the study, which will have more meaningful uh, result in terms of this comparative understanding of politics and system uh, and uh, various institutions uh, in the world and most particularly the third world uh, countries. But one thing is to be remembered that even in this period, when uh, political system approach and structural functionalism were trying to basically downgrade uh, this importance of state in comparative politics. Many scholars were not quite convinced, uh, were not quite convinced with this idea and they were still uh, reflecting on the state. And therefore, what we find that the study uh, of a state or the interest in a state never died down completely. And subsequently, when there was a resurgence, when system and uh, you know, the uh, structural functional approaches lost the sign uh, or basically did not have much following uh, or its limitations, their limitations were realized by the scholars. We find that the new churning, uh, you know, started which was dormant during this period became suddenly prominent and therefore in comparative politics as we had discussed in our earlier lecture, new institutionalism as a new approach to understand this entire you know uh, issue came up and new institutionalism with various uh, you know various shades including the structural uh, shade of new institutionalism which is associated uh, with Theda Squawk Paul and many others are perhaps specifically symptomatic of this uh, mood or one can say that they still uh, tell us that how this comparative politics kept its interest in the state alive even in this period when perhaps it was under assault from this system and structural functional approaches. In fact, even in India at that time, uh, one of the most 
celebrated writing on Indian politics of the period, uh, you know, politics in India by Rajni Kothari, uh, operationalized this entire structural, functional, and system perspective, and uh, doesn't refer to state, but he talks of system, political system, with all those uh, attributes of system and all those uh, categories and concepts through which this system uh, theory was trying to uh, look at power and authority. Uh, for example, uh, political culture, communication, uh, mobilization, and so on and so forth. But the same Rajni Kothari later on, we find uh, that uh, went for uh, a replacement of that category and came out with another book, A State Against Democracy, and uh, gave prominence to this entire idea of a state. Of course, one thing is to remember that within Marxism, a state never lost its sign so far as the discussion of power and authority is concerned. Even if many new refinements were made, even if new, uh, you know, intellectual churnings happened, uh, be it Althusser, be it Gramsci, uh, be it subsequently, you know, Habermas, and so on and so forth, particularly the critical school, uh, the Frankfurt school, but nonetheless, a state remained the important category for understanding power and authority. But within liberalism, there was definitely a period when a state was replaced with system, and a scholars th thought that perhaps system would be more appropriate, you know, category to discuss power and authority. But you know, what we find that within liberal tradition, therefore, uh, what we find that uh, this entire question of uh, this, you know, the state uh, in modern times, uh, historically, of course, it is traced to Treaty of Westphalia, and subsequently, as I mentioned, uh, this federal revolution of federal innovation in the United States of America uh, with the Federalist Paper, Madison, uh, you know, Hamilton and Jay, and then, of course, a written document, Dick and Constitution, which has basically inspired generation of, uh, you know, theorists and scholars, and today perhaps is the dominant, one of the dominant model. Uh, nonetheless, Westphalian model has also not uh, totally got replaced. It is still there. France is best example, but there are many more examples of this model. And then I was also mentioning uh, that Commonwealth uh, model, uh, parliamentary federal model of uh, Canada, 1867, Australia, New Zealand, India, 1947, 50, 1950 constitution, and so on and so forth. So these are basically the institutional evolution of the state in modern times. But so far the theoretical uh, innovation is concerned. Theoretical innovation, of course, uh, is heavily inspired by uh, the scholarship of, uh, you know, this, uh, the liberal uh, thinkers of that period. And here, one is particularly reminded of the social contract theorists, uh, particularly Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, when they talked of the origin of a state, that how ultimately it is human creation. It is based on the consent. Neither it is a divine, uh, divinely ordained, neither it, has, neither it has been sent by the God, nor it is simply the product of war or, uh, you know, force, but rather it is a contract among people, the consent of the people. And therefore, that was the beginning of a new understanding of a democratic state, that how a state is to be best, a state authority or power is to be related to the consent of the people. This is how a concept of limited government, this is how the constitution and constitutionalism became a dominant theme in this entire discussion, that how power is to, to be understood in a very limited sense, that power is to be limited by law and constitution. So constitution uh, became the important hallmark of this entire democratic churning, that democracy which is a raw power of the people cannot be left unfettered and therefore there has to be a limitation uh, from law and constitution and this is how constitutionalism and democracy got entwined. And this is how uh, scholars normally associate that ideas of Locke and idea of Rousseau started complementing each other. If general will as the people's raw power in Rousseau uh, was important for democracy, but at the same time limited government uh, or the law and constitution of Locke also became equally important. So therefore, a new harmony was established between the two concepts. And therefore, this entire understanding of a state within liberal tradition in comparative politics started uh, working with this new uh, insights given by the social contract uh, theorists, particularly Locke and Rousseau. Of course, Hobbes himself, uh, Hobbes also contributed uh, significantly through his idea of 
uh, you know, the sovereignty and so on and so forth. But the most important uh, or equally important one can say, contribution was made by idealist, German idealist philosopher Hegel, uh, who for the first time talked about state, civil society, family and individual, these four categories. Uh, for the first time talked about the historical evolution of the state and therefore for the first time this entire idea of a state uh, became significant for social science and gradually political science also draws heavily on Hegelian notion of the state. Of course, Hegel looked at a state as the march of God on the earth, but of course, Hegel's philosophy has to be seen in a much more nuanced way than simply uh, just having, uh, you know, discussed it as, as, you know, march of God on the earth. So, Hegel, who influenced Karl Marx, because, uh, you know, a lot of debate on this issue as well, early Marx, late Marx, Hegelian Marx, post-Hegelian Marx, that is there. Uh, but one thing is to remember that Hegel influenced Marx because of his profound understanding of this state, which perhaps was not there before him. And therefore, what happened that the way, uh, you know, Hegel made a distinction between a state and civil society, that perhaps uh, became the inspiring idea uh, for Karl Marx. But of course, Marx went beyond this and understood it uh, in his own way by making a historical materialist understanding. Of course, at, at, at times it is referred that Marx put Hegel, uh, you know, he, Hegel's ideas were standing on the head and he put it upside down. Uh, but, you know, it was not simply that. But what I am trying to say that the civil society state discussion in Hegel came in Marx in a big way. And this is how Marx arrived at his entire understanding of state as an as institution which is a product of alienated society. Uh, in fact, his entire theory of alienation is not simply confined to the capitalist relations, but even the religion and the state, Karl Marx, uh, you know, talks about in this entire frame of alienation. But not only that, the state, the understanding of a state in Marx is also quite nuanced. For example, he, it is believed that he wanted to write a whole book on the state, which perhaps he didn't. But nonetheless, from his critique of German ideology, Gotha program, the Communist Manifesto, the Capital, a number of, uh, you know, scattered passages, statements, arguments, theories, scholars have tried to build, uh, a, or one time, uh, one can say that scholars, particularly the Marxist scholars have tried to create a coherent understanding of a state within Marxist tradition. And then the debate has also happened within that, that what is perhaps the dominant understanding of a state within Marxism. And as I was referring earlier, the instrumentalist understanding is referred as the dominant understanding. But nonetheless, it is also mentioned, it is also argued that instrumentalist understanding was not the only understanding. There were other, uh, you know, insights about the functioning of the state. For example, 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, that piece of writing which talks of relative autonomy of the state because it is generally believed that for Marxism, a state will be only the managing committee of the bourgeoisie. A state will only take the dictation from the ruling class. But 18th Brumaire talks that how in certain historical situation, a state can also attain relative autonomy. And this concept of relative autonomy has basically generated a very lively debate within Marxism, particularly between Polanjas and Miliband. Similarly, the question of hegemony, the role of ideology, because ideology is seen as false consciousness within Marxist tradition, but sometimes it also becomes a form of consciousness, real consciousness. How that creates a situation where ruling class simply does not rule through coercion, but also rules through consent. And this is the entire uh, concept of hegemony as perhaps developed by Italian philosopher Gramsci. So what I am trying to say that like liberalism, Marxism also is equally you know, uh, vibrant so far as the debates and discussions on the state is concerned. Of course, if, if, along with Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau, uh, we have also have Bentham, the utilitarian philosopher, John Stuart Mill, uh, you know, uh, whose ideas on the state, particularly, you know, the way he talked about a democratic state uh, and uh, many other liberal thinkers. And not to forget the contribution of the classical economists like Adam Smith, uh, Ricardo and Malthus, particularly the wealth of nations of Adam Smith, which talked about a laissez-faire state. And uh, subsequently in the 20th century, the entire concept of welfare state 
uh, with Fabianism uh, as standing between liberalism and Marxism, contributions of Harold Lossky and many other political scientists. They have basically uh, inspired whole host of uh, scholarship within comparative politics and political science. And therefore, this debate on, on the state in comparative politics is so important, so prominent and so interesting. Uh, in fact, this debate part we will be taking up in our next lecture. Definitely, we would be discussing uh, the debate part in our uh, next lecture. Friends, if you want to give your feedbacks for today's lecture, then do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. We would be meeting again soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much.